Hello, this is Tim Congdon, Chair of the Institute of Inter International Monetary Research at the University of Buckingham. Um, it's July 2023, uh, and this is the usual monthly video that I do on global monetary trends and what they mean for the future of the world economy. Uh, today I'm going to try and kill two birds with one stone, uh, in that I want to spend, say, five or six minutes uh, looking at the, indeed, the money trends and related topics. We're just about in the middle of 2023, so it's an opportune time for that. But I also want to look at um, what are the cause of inflation, and I want to consider a non-monetary theory of inflation. I want to talk about does globalization affect inflation? So those are the two things I'm going to cover in the next 15 minutes or so. Now, I know that our followers are interested in our views on what's happening to money numbers, and um, so I will just quickly run through that. Here's the chart in the United States. Uh, money has stopped falling in the last couple of months, went up slightly in May, and on the preliminary numbers we've got probably went up in June as well, but not by very much. And so we've still got, when we look at the uh, three-month annualized numbers and the annual figures, they're both still kind of moving down. And um, the uh, when we allow for the fact that there's still rather high inflation in the United States, money balances in real terms are still contracting. This is the monetary background for recession. Now let me concede that we haven't had a recession in the first half of 2023. It remains the correct view to take if all, all these monetary pointers are saying there's going to be a recession uh, in probably starting in the second half of this year. Okay, uh, here's the chart for the Eurozone, uh, and you'll see that um, uh, I think the very buoyant numbers uh, in 2020, 2021, the cause of inflation in 2023 in the Institute's view, and then this sharp, and then the recent months actually going down, quantity money actually falling. And so that in six of the last eight months for which we have figures, the M3 measure of money has actually fallen, actually gone down. And um, I just say here, one of the reasons is that the European Central Bank is actually trying to reduce the size of its own balance sheet and is asking uh, central banks around the euro system to reduce their lending to banks, which then makes the banks, um, they can't have got the funding, so they don't have to, re to reduce their loans to customers. That's part of what's going on here. Again, uh, falling money, rising interest rates, recession. There has in fact been a technical recession in the Eurozone in the first half of 2023, more serious one probably coming up later on this year and in 24. Then look at the United Kingdom. Here too, the last eight months, which had figured that six of them have got fallen the quantity of money. Um, some things to say about um, weakness of Credit growth, bank lending is going down, so money growth is very weak. In fact, money has been, has been going down as well. So again, this fits in with a recession story. Now, at the start of the year, I said there's going to be a two-speed world economy, basically relatively uh, resilient, even robust uh, demand growth in Asia, while we had these uh, problems in the traditional Western economies, uh, USA, Eurozone, UK, and so on. And... Um, that's what's happened. Uh, China has been disappointing in 2023, but in India, money growth has actually picked up a bit this year, and demand growth has been very buoyant. There's talk of 6 7%, maybe even 8% growth uh, in India uh, in 2023. Indonesia, 5%. Malaysia, 4.5%. Vietnam, 7 8%. These kinds of numbers, and therefore the world economy is still growing. Um, but by probably this year, less than 3%, possibly even under 2.5%. These are not the kind of numbers that were typical for much of the 1990s and the opening years of the 21st century. Yes, inflation is coming down. Yes, next year, uh, interest rates should come down too. 
but in the context uh, in the West of recessions. I'm not changing my view on that. Okay, so that's to sort of summarize the global outlook. Um, I wanted to, uh, the rest of today's video, to pick up on an article in the Financial Times. This gives me a pretext to uh, discuss one of these non-monetary theories of inflation. Um, if we, um, I said earlier on this year that I'd be looking at I view inflation as caused by excessive money growth. This view has been a huge success in the last two or three years. But there are many people who stick to the view that inflation is caused by excessive growth of costs or something else. And there's this commonly held argument that the reason that inflation came down in the 1990s and the opening years 21st century is because there's rapid growth of world trade. Obviously, nations wouldn't import from other countries if the prices were higher, so the prices must be lower, and that lowering of prices, according to this argument, uh, then dampens down inflation. And according to some people, this is the key reason that uh, inflation stayed down in this, in this the relatively benign period of the world economy uh, from the end of communism in 1991 uh, up until the Great Recession and then on into the 2010s. And we had an article um, in the Financial Times by John Plender um, on the 7th of July, which um, first of all was very kind to us, and it made a reference to me and Steve Hank in the United States as economists who'd been right about inflation. Uh, so thank you, John, for that. By the way, John and I were both on the Times Business News as journalists almost 50 years ago. Uh, both now in our 70s and still following these matters. Um, but John also said that um, the good news today is that bonds no longer offer terrible value because bond yields have shot up. Um, and um, central bankers tend to attribute low inflation during the golden period of 1990s and so on, 40 years up to, um, they attribute low inflation during this period, that not, not to their sagacity, but the real driver of, of disinflation was globalization. Well, John, there's the challenge. Uh, I'm afraid you're wrong. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is explain why. Now, on the face of it, the logic is compelling. Uh, you know, you wouldn't, as I say, buy things from other countries unless they were cheaper. Um, but let's try and be precise. Um, are we talking about, are we talking about globalization, globalization affecting prices and inflation? Are we talking about the price level or the change in prices? And is it the process of globalization, the change in globalization that leads to a, a lower price level or a change in inflation or a change in the price level or what? We must have a testable hypothesis, all right? We need to have a measure of globalization, and then we need to compare that with uh, what's happening to an inflation rate. Now, what I'm going to do here is to take some numbers that are in the World Bank database. They show the ratio of trade to GDP for most of the world's countries, going back quite a long way. They have got some problems. They are essentially nominal trade uh, relative to nominal GDP, so that when you get a big shift in the terms of trade, that will alter the ratio of trade to GDP. Some people should they use the volumes of trade relative to volume of GDP. Again, we should say we need to be precise about what hypothesis is. Now anyway, let's just, using this series, um, from the World Bank database, this is the UK now, compare trade intensity uh, with the rate of consumer inflation. This is the level of trade relative to GDP, the level of the degree of the globalization, if you wish, compared with the rate of consumer price inflation. 
taking this back to 1970, the numbers are annual. Can you see a relationship here? You can see that there was quite a surge in the trade to GDP ratio in the early 1970s. Part of that was an oil price effect, let me concede, but much of it was actually to, due to the continuing effects of trade liberalization under the trade rounds organized by what was then the uh, Global Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, the World Trade Organization didn't exist. Uh, and the, under the GATT rounds, there was considerable reductions in tariffs, uh, and this caused the ratio of trade to GDP to rise in the UK as elsewhere. Let me say here that the UK was a pretty open economy even in the 1950s, certainly compared with uh, much of the rest of the world at that stage. And so the impact on inflation would have been less favorable or less noticeable than elsewhere anyhow. But anyway, if you try to carry out a regression between these two series, I can assure you, you get nothing worthwhile at all. There is no relationship at all between these two series. The level of globalization has no effect on the inflation rate. Let's then try the change in the degree of trade intensity. That's the clutch, well, it's supposed to be rising steadily over time, isn't it? So all, the whole time, the ratio of trade to GDP is increasing. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, what you see here for the UK uh, is that, so uh, the blue line, is that many years the ratio of trade to GDP went down. Indeed, there isn't really a predominance of years in which it's rising, although I should say that, in fact, at the end of this period, 2021 or 2022, the ratio of trade to GDP was higher than in 1970. Uh, can you see a relationship? Uh, again, I can assure you, carry out standard ordinarily squares regression, there's no relationship there at all. Sorry, there just is no relationship here. Now, why is this so? The answer to me is there is going to be some effect from globalization on the price level. There'll be some continuing effect. And perhaps if we had sufficiently detail, we probably we might find that. We've got to really hunt for it. And how much would it be? Each year it would be 0.05% on the inflation rate, 0.1%, 0.2%. These kinds of numbers, they don't explain inflation rates in the 20s in the, or double-digit inflation rates at all. For that, we must look at money. Okay. We sometimes get comments on the China effect. You know, uh, the, uh, China was a closed economy uh, until the uh, 1980s. Then there was the dramatic trade liberalization uh, under Deng Xiaoping and the rapid growth both of trade and of the Chinese economy itself. Uh, and um, th this then led to sharp rises in the uh, imports, the ratio of imports to GDP for many countries, including the UK. So what I've done here is to prepare a chart on the ratio of imports from China to Britain's GDP uh, going back to uh, when is going back to 1999, when that ratio was in fact under half a percent. You know, the Chinese trade the began in the 1980s, even 1999, it was our imports from China were under under half percent of GDP. They'd already grown a lot. Then you see this rapid increase. So that um, by last year imports from China were over 3% of GDP. That's pretty dramatic, you might think, and doesn't that go along with the major effect on prices? Look, let's just remember that, um, you know, there's GDP, there's 100%, and there's this China effect, this, this imports from China, which is, which is 3%. The, 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 how can you explain what's happening to prices for the 97% of GDP by appealing to what's happening to... And it's only become 3% of GDP in the recent past. Now appears to be stabilizing. You can't explain 
uh, the moderation of inflation in Britain and other countries in the last 30 or 40 years by the China effect is just too small, obviously so. I'm now going to move away from the UK and refer to a country which I wouldn't normally mention in these videos, but I think is quite good at bringing out the point I'm trying to make. It's Turkey. Now, Turkey in the 1950s had practically no external trade at all. Uh, obviously, there'd been the Second World War when there was no, no Turkey was very neutral, uh, avoided contact with the rest of the world, avoided the fighting, uh, and um, didn't really get involved uh, in the uh, liberalization of the world economy in the decades immediately after the war. So um, it remained very insular, autarkic, and, uh, and the ratio of trade to GDP in 1960 uh, was about 5%. Over the following, uh, what is it now, 60 years or so, Turkey has changed radically. Um, has participated in global trade liberalization, very important. It's joined the European Union's customs union so that there is more or less free trade between Turkey and the European Union, although of course it's not a member of the European Union. So in the last few years, uh, the ratio of trade to GDP for Turkey is now, is now higher than the UK, higher indeed than most European countries, a bit to my surprise, but it's actually over 60%. Last year is 70% or so, it's very, very high. So here, globalization really has happened. If globalization were the cause of low inflation, we'd expect Turkey to have a very low inflation rate. Sorry. Uh, Turkey, in the last 30 years, has had an average inflation rate of 36%, ups and downs a bit. Very high rate of inflation, by the way, last year. Um, but um, there, I'm afraid, this simply doesn't bring out the... Um, the view that globalization necessarily leads to what has driven Turkey's inflation rate in that period, the rate of growth of the quantity of money relative to the trend rate of growth of output. I'm sorry, it's very boring, but it's always true. So when we're trying to um, understand this subject, we must always come back to money. Uh, you know, the basis of our success in forecasting inflation in the last three years has been following monetary trends. Globalization does not explain uh, inflation in the golden period, 40 years up to whenever, um, and it doesn't, and deglobalization doesn't explain the inflation of the last two or three years either. It's just not big enough, uh, in any case, trying to understand and, and interpret these trends is difficult because of the problems with the definitions. So let me just kind of um, summarize that. You know, I'm, not, I'm not against globalization, <laughs> get that clear. Uh, and and I, I'm sure that globalization contributes to economic efficiency. You know, it, it, it does mean that the, uh, the best practice technologies spread around the world. Uh, um, we get economy, economies specializing things they're good at. They're able, they can then have economies of scale, as explained by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. In 1776, um, it, it um, means that we get the best capital goods from foreign countries, the most uh, productive, most efficient capital goods. All these things are helped by free trade and globalization, and they do have an effect uh, on the price level. But actually, when you're trying to understand movements in inflation year by year, no, they don't. They don't add any. Add it, this, these ideas don't add any insight. We always come back to money. I'm sorry to, to, to reach this conclusion because in some ways I'd like to reach uh, a more emphatic endorsement of globalization, um, but the facts are that this non-monetary theory of inflation doesn't work. Thank you.